An astounding morning to one and all present here. Dr. Endra Educational and Research Institute, Faculty of Humanities and Science, Department of English, is organizing a two-day national webinar on the topic, Modernism and Modern Literature for the first day and Postmodernism Philosophy and Literature for the second day. Now let's start our session with Tamritai Varthit. pleasure to welcome you all to the first day of this national webinar. Today, we have a renowned and an eminent speaker, Ms. Deepanjali Roy. She is going to enrich us with her lecture on the topic Modernism and Modern Literature. Now, I call upon Dr. Chandrasena Men, Head, Department of English, Dr. Enjar Educational and Research Institute, to welcome the virtual gathering. Ma'am? Uh, good morning. Happy good morning to everybody. It's my honor and privilege to welcome this August gathering on this occasion wherein we are giving the national webinar on modernism and modern literature as well as on postmodernism and literature. So it's a good occasion and in the, it, this cannot be possible without the support from our management. So it's my duty to welcome our honorable uh, founder chairman, Dr. ACS, AC Shanmugam, our honorable president, engineer ACS Arun Kumar, our vice chancellor, Dr. Geeta Lakshmi Man, our ever smiling uh, um, registrar, Dr. C.B. Palnivelu, to this august occasion. And I am also uh, quite thankful to the other management team, which is always supporting our venture, whatever it could be, whether it's a webinar or a panel discussion, whatever it be, they are there to help us in all possible ways. So I welcome um, our joint register, Dr. Malini Pandema, joint register, Ian Dis, Dr. Jabaraj, and our, our deans of our department, Dr. Mary Thomas and Dr. Pushkala ma'am for this gathering. And I expect this occasion and this presentation which is going to be given by Ms. Dibanjali Rai will be an eye opener to this kind of modernism and modern literature, which is a topic which puzzles our students, especially our MA students. So that is the reason I asked her to have this session. I'm thankful to her for accepting my invitation. And thank you, Ms. Deba and I We expect to hear from you a lot of information. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Now uh, I call upon Ms. Priya Dashini, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Dr. MJR Educational and Research Institute, to introduce the chief guest. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our today's chief guest, Ms. Dibanjali Roy, an assistant professor in the School of Language, KITT Univer KIIT University. She has a culminative teaching experience of seven years in the postgraduate and undergraduate level of studies. Prior to joining KIIT University, she was a faculty member in the Department of English, Damas University, and also served the position of Assistant Dean Students Affair for a brief period. She was a recipient of T.S. Sterling Scholarship for Academic Excellence in the undergraduate students from the Presidency College, Calcutta. Besides MA in English Language and Literature from University of Calcutta, she also holds a postgraduate diploma in Journalism and Mass Communication from Jadavpur University. 
she is uh, pursuing her doctoral degree from the department of english university of calcutta and has significantly contributed to the field of applied linguistics and literature through her research publications and academic affiliations her research and academic interest areas include applied linguistics and nlt elizabethan theater romantic art and literature modern art and literature popular fiction and culture film studies and creative writing her dedication towards academics received recognition in the form of professional scholarships funded by the regional english language office she was also an awardee of the travel grant sponsored by university of calcutta to oxford university and uk and the prestigious erasmus mundus teacher exchange fellowship for the year 2020 which was funded by the european union welcome ma'am thank you ma'am that was a crisp and crystal introduction now i cordially invite madam ms dipanjali roy to take over the session ma'am um thank you so much ma'am for this uh, wonderful introduction um uh, am i audible actually um my voice is kind of choked i'm having fever so i'm not really sure i mean uh, can you hear me clearly now yes it's very clear ma'am thank you so much thank you so much uh, everyone for uh, uh, joining this session and uh, this topic that i'm going to talk about today this is a very broad one it is a uh, the topic is titled or rather the session is titled modernism and modern literature now um, in our undergraduate studies as well as in our postgraduate studies what we basically learn i mean what is there in our syllabus is introduction to uh, modernism and discussion of modernism as a phenomenon uh, and uh, which arose during the 20th century and uh, we we talk about modernist literature the trends of modernist literature the philosophies and the art movements which shaped this uh, grandism if i may so today i'm going to talk about this uh, this topic and uh, the, i am under the impression that the session is mostly attended by students from the post graduate department uh, Uh, of studies so i will be focusing on three things for this session the first one is going to be a discussion of the terms modern modernity and modernism where i will try to clarify or rather throw some light clarification is once again a very dicey term so i will rather try to uh, talk about and throw some light on the terms uh, modern modernity and modernism and thereupon i will be talking about how uh, you know modernism as a phenomenon as a, as a cultural artistic literary phenomenon rose during the 20th century as a reaction against contemporary modernity and i will be tracing the journey of modernism or rather the evolution of modernism through the art movements and then i will be talking about what we preferably known as the modernist literature so does this plan seem okay for the students out here because after all this session is primarily for you people it's uh, mostly so that you know after this session you have something to take away so does this plan look okay to all of you if it if it does just uh, raise your hand or give a thumbs up whichever is possible so uh, okay all right uh, thank you so much and it feels really uh, lovely to uh, see quite a few familiar faces uh, in the session thank you so uh, ma'am may i start my presentation yes ma'am um, yes we can we can thank you thank you so much ma'am is my screen visible to everybody is the screen visible to everyone visible, uh, thank you yeah presentation yeah. it's not visible at me is it is it now yes ma'am it's okay. visible ma thank you thank you so much thank you so much so um in the next uh 
are, I mean, uh, I will try to wrap it up by 11.15 uh, so that, you know, we can uh, have a little bit of time to discuss as well. So I, as I said, I will be talking primarily uh, and uh, significantly on the terms modern, modernity and modernism, where I will try to look at how the usage of the word modern has changed over a period of time. So the term modern, it comes from the Latin word modo or modus, which represents a sense of contemporaneity, which represents something that is just happening now, which is happening just recently. So this term modern is very much located in time. And when we speak about the location of the time, uh, I'm sorry, location of the term in time, it's to be noted that this term is not so recent. Although this term means just recently, it's interesting that the term was first used in the late 15th century where it was used to segregate the Christian present from the Roman pagan past. Okay. Now, when we talk about the terms modern, modernity, and modernism, there is, a, a, I mean, we tend to make, a, a, we, we, we generally, we tend to make a, a mistake by equating the terms modernity and modernism. So through the first half of my presentation, I will be trying to differentiate between the terms modernity and modernism. Now, modernity in the simplistic sense, it means the idea of being modern. And we know that the, the term modern means something which is just happening now, which is relevant to our present times, which is contemporaneous to us. So this idea of modernity, it's located just, I mean, not just within the containment of the term that, you know, you, you have the capacity of being modern, you have the capacity of being relevant at the present times, but it has also got a layer of uh, you know, uh, it, it, has, it has also got a layer of other meanings as well. And now we'll be trying to decode those meanings. So the idea of modernity is basically a qualitative aspect. It has a historical location as well. And the idea of modernity in the present sense that we know, it was used for the first time at the end of around 18th century, mostly by Horace Walpole, when he was segregating the work of art i mean he was he was commenting on the poem by thomas shatterton so uh, uh, this term of uh, modernity at that point in time uh, it continued to or, or rather it uh, it uh, uh, you know it, it, it tried to imbibe the sense of distastefulness it, it tried to imbibe the sense of vulgarity as opposed to the previous generations now, in France, during the same time and around uh, the you know, 19th centuries as well, the term modernity came to signify the distasteful. And this, when, when I use the word distasteful, once again, there is a segregation, there is a delineation, a sharp delineation between the present works of art and those prior to it. And those prior, when I say the term those prior to it, I mean the grand romantic landscape the aesthetic tastes, which came to signify the later half of the 18th century. Now, uh, 1859, this year is particularly important in the, ter in, the, uh, in the context of understanding the concept of modernity, because it was uh, in this year that, that, that Le Pientre de la Vie Moderne was published by Charles Baudelaire, where for the first time he was proposing a very modernized concept of modernity, a concept of modernity which was inherently traced, which could be inherently traced rather in the socio-cultural context and a concept that tried to interconnect art and life. So for the first time we see that you know we are getting we are reaching towards uh, understanding modernity not simply as a phenomenon or not simply as a trend that is located in time but something that has to do with the literary aesthetics as well now if you see the slide you will find the name of la fleur du mal which is uh, which roughly translates to the flowers of evil now most of us in the session here are aware of this famous poem by uh, charles baudelaire and uh, the reason why I'm saying that uh, most of us are familiar with this, because, you know, it is considered to be one of the pioneer works of modernist poetry, uh, where uh, the themes related to death, decay, instead disintegration, alienation, self-disgust, uh, and representation of the world uh, is being depicted. And this poem is supposed to have influenced not only... <coughs> 
excuse me this uh, this particular poem this particular uh, treatise by uh, charles baudelaire is supposed to have influenced the, the symbolist and the decadent movement in france and interestingly it also inspired the famous uh, once again when we talk about modernism our discussion remains incomplete if we do not talk about t.s eliot so uh, this particular text is uh, inspired T.S. Eliot to produce the manifesto of modernist literature. And when I say the manifesto of modernist literature, I obviously mean the wasteland. To the extent that if we have read the wasteland, and in uh, those of us in the session, those the students in the session, if we have read the wasteland, we will find that there are verbatim quotes from Baudelaire in Eliot's poetry. So I will be discussing about that in a while. Now, um, as I told you, that modernity basically refers to the condition or the quality of being modern. And simplistically saying, it means a break from the past traditions. Now, this term, this trend of being modern, this trend of breaking from the past traditions, it has uh, the term itself has suffered an evolution as well. And as I told you, that you know, it was used for the first time in the uh, 18th century referring to uh, Horace Walpole. So by the time we reach 20th century, the term modernity was also changing. OK, so we, we, we find that, yes, this term is located very much in time. But also, we have to understand that this term is located outside time as well. And when I say it's located outside time, I try to refer to modernity as an attribute which transcends the linearity of time or which transcends the location of time so uh, i mean it's it's very uh, it's very uh, interesting to note or it's it's a pertinent question that most most people often ask that uh, you know uh, if modern if that if the if the term modern uh, refers to uh, relevance in the present time in the contemporary times then if i find if if i find a relevance in a in shakespearean text for example if we are reading a text like macbeth and uh, maybe if we are reading a text like hamlet and we find it relevant very relevant in our present time then is it modern i would say yes uh, any text that you find relevance in your present time is definitely modern. And therein comes the difference between what is a modern text and what is a modernist text. Okay, So uh, coming back to what we were talking about, how the term modernity has evolved over time. And uh, when we come to, when we, uh, talk, uh, when we have already talked about how the term what the term modernity tried to express in the 18th or tried to mean during the 18th and the 19th century. So by the time we reach 20th century and the world order is also changing by this time, we find that the term modernity, it started becoming more complex and more fluid in nature. So it's very paradoxical. Uh, the term, uh, it, it tries to signify something which is paradoxical and something that embraces the paradox within it as well. So talking about that, aesthetic modernity was proposed by Walter Benjamin on, on two concepts at, at that point in time. So one was the concept proposed by Baudrillard and the other one by Charles Baudelaire. Now, Baudelaire was talking about the characteristic figure of modernity uh, where he was introducing the concept of flaneur. And uh, when he was uh, talking about the flaneur, he was basically referring to the objective wanderer and the participator of the urban landscape. So a, a, a person, a figure who objectively strolls across the city and becomes a participator of the urban landscape. So he espouses his, uh, uh, his concept of modernity through the class of evil, where he talks about the beauty in the vile. He talks about the decay. He talks about a resemblance, uh, a, you know, a, a resemblance as well as embracing the change that is going on in, in, in the times, in the contemporary times. Now, the other part of aesthetic modernity, which Walter Benjamin talks about, is through the image of Paris, which was proposed by Baudrillard. Now, for Baudrillard, the image of Paris was the seat of culture during the 19th century. So uh, it was also the seat of consumerism and commodity fetishism. 
right so when we look at aesthetic modernity something that went on to shape the uh, or, or something that went on to uh, usher in the trend of modernism this is quite relevant now uh, just a moment please the term modernism as i have noted it's basically a grand narrative of the new energies which swept through the west during the late 19th century and continued to uh, uh, you know characterize the entire european existence if i may through the 20th century now uh, modernism as a phenomenon uh, i mean if we are asked to define modernism it would be better to put it uh, uh, in in the simplistic terms of an artistic literary and philosophical reaction to the past traditions now when i talk about the artistic literary and the philosophical uh, reactions of course uh, they have been driven by the uh, by the socio economic theories of karl marx uh, sigmund freud andre bergson and frederick nietzsche to name a few now when we look at modernist period when we look at the period of modernism we refer to <coughs> a period that starts generally around the 1900s and in ends towards the late 1940s and 50s and uh, this is quite important in our in, in our discussion of modern modernity and modernism because uh, you know by this time we have understood that the term modern it refers to something which is contemporary which has a relevance to our present times the idea of modernity it's representative of the characteristic of embodying the sense of relevance in the present time but the term modernism it has a particular historical location it has a particular temporal location it has got a particular spatial location as well and so the term modernism is usually associated with the literary and cultural movement which flourished in the first decades of the 20th century now interestingly although i have written that it is a literary and cultural movement which uh, uh, flourished during the first decades of the 20th century it interest it's interesting to note in this regard that the entire 20th century i mean the journey from modernism to coming to arriving at a sense of post modernism which will of course be dealt with in, in in tomorrow's lecture so this entire journey not only of modernism but post modernism as well it was a uh, grounded by it was grounded on the philosophies it was grounded on the theories of the time that we, which we spoke about just a while ago now modernism as i said uh, it is not it's not a term to which a single meaning can be ascribed because if it is something which has a which has which is a grand narrative of isms something that can be looked at from multiple perspectives through art through literature through music through dance so there, there cannot be any single linear definition of this term yet once again there is a common thread which unites all these phenomena together and that is a sense or a reflection of a sense of cultural crisis which was characterized in that period which, which characterized the period if i mean so this reflection of a sense of cultural crisis was both exciting and it as well it was disquieting in nature so yes the world was moving towards a technological advancement the world was moving towards a a, a kind of a, a sense of modernization in terms of urbanization in terms of advancement in science and technology which was exciting which was which was exciting practically because it opened a whole new vista of human possibilities but then again it was disquieting it was discomforting as well because this these new possibilities these new approaches for example fordism taylorism so all these uh, you know th these were questioning the previously accepted means of faith so we understand that when we talk about a sense of cultural crisis it was a crisis in faith as well it was a crisis in the belief structures as well and therefore to put it once again i have been repeating myself to put it very simply modernist texts be it poetry be it novel be it any ideas during uh, characterized during the early half of the 20th century it's marked by experimentation and particularly there is a manipulation of form so those of us uh, 
I mean, uh, the undergrad students or the postgrad students in the session, those of you who have read uh, Pound's poetry or those of you who have read Eliot's poetry, you have you must have noted that there is a there is a, a deliberate play with the form. There is a deliberate break from the traditional conventional modes of writing. So if you look at Joyce's uh, Ulysses, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, the novels by Virginia Woolf, you will find that not only is the content very different from the previous ones, but also the form. The form is changing. In my class, I usually give the example of the tea and the teacup. So if the, if the quality of the tea was changing, so the cup needed to change as well. And when we look at modernist artists, modernist poets, modernist novelists, for example, if we look at Picasso, Van Gogh, we, we look at Eliot, we look at Pound, we look at uh, Spender, all these poets, we look at uh, James Joyce, they were experimenting. They were experimenting with the form, with the structure in which literature could be accommodated. Because, and, and this because is very important at this point, because, you know, uh, uh, th this playing with the form, it's a... Uh, uh, it is, it is the trademark, it's, it's a hallmark of modernist uh, movement of 20th century. Now, uh, uh, this, this reason, the reason why they were playing with the forms was, uh, was very simple. They were dissatisfied with the conventional forms of literature. They, they believed, or, or rather they, they were of the opinion that the conventional forms of literature could not accommodate the real essence of literature at that point in time. Because after all, the function of literature is basically to reflect the realities of, of, of life, is, is to be able to serve as a bridge between life and the text. So this was missing. And therefore, there was a manipulation in the form as well as the content. Now, Virginia Woolf very rightly and very aptly noted that in or about 1910, the human character changed. And uh, I mean, this basically uh, leads me to talk about the timeline in, of, of modernism during the 20th century in brief. So 1900s to 1910s, it was the Edwardian and the Georgian era, which I believe they were the last roots of stability before the First World War broke from 1914. Now, from 1914 to 1918 was the First World War, which uh, which uh, showed uh, which was an unprecedented uh, horror and devastation uh, <coughs> raged across the world. In the aftermath of the war, 1920s, it was characterized by the post-war disillusions, the loss of faith, emotional, spiritual, and intellectual sterility. In the 1930s, there was a depression and unemployment, and which saw the rise of Hitler and fascism. Towards 1939 to 45, there was the Second World War, which once again experienced a nuclear horror, Holocaust, genocide. And uh, the late 1940s, there was the birth of existentialism. So, this is basically more or less uh, the the timeline, if I may, if, if at all we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, put it into what it, I mean. Once again, the compartments are not watertight, but if, if at all we can compartmentalize that what characterizes as a, a you know as as modernism of twentieth century. This these are some of the major markers for that. Now, when we talk about literature during the twentieth century, something. Uh, you know, uh, I've been trying to talk about. So uh, it, the first thing that, uh, you know, comes under the purview of discussion is the First World War and the aftermath of the war. So uh, most of us know from our undergrad uh, studies and, uh, you know, because World War poetry is uh, is there in, in, in not only the undergrad studies, but we are introduced to the poetry, the literature during the World War from uh, the later half of our, of our uh, you know, uh, from our class 10s and 12s as well. So... Uh, we, we find that when, when we look at the poets who were writing during the First World War, so there is a journey from glorifying war and from a sense of patriotism to arriving at a very bleak vision of reality. Most of them were soldier poets. So the first time they went on to the battlefield, there was a sense of patriotism, there is this enthusiastic zeal. But 
most of them i mean when i talk about the soldier poets i'm of course referring to wilfred owen uh, who experienced war uh, from the trenches and who wrote poetry from the trenches so there were, uh, i mean in when we look at the poets uh, during the first world war we usually look at a first hand experience from their end and this first hand experience that they are sharing through their poetry there there was a scathing criticism of the entire vision of warfare so there is nothing grand about war there is only the rapid rifles rattling rattle so uh, we we look at the humongous loss of human lives the millions of casualties and therefore the main theme of literature of poetry during this period is the pity of war the pity war is stilled so they are trying to break away from the past representations of warfare where war was basically glorified and there was a sense of nationalism there was a sense of patriotism associated with these terms so the replacement of those glorif glorifications those the replacement of those uh, romanticized jargons was uh, it, it was it, the, those jargons were replaced by a scathing criticism which once again projected a very bleak nature a very bleak vision of the present reality now um it was a time as i told you that uh, you know it was marked by uh, innovation and mass production of new technology the media i, I mean uh, if i i mean it, it, as i told you in the very beginning that talking about modernism and the trends of modernism because it's a, it's a grand narrative it's, so many things are happening at the same time so it's very difficult to talk about everything within a very short span of one hour right so um i have basically tried to touch upon all the points all the necessary points and this is one of the significant and one of the driving forces of modernism at a later point so uh, we we talked about how there was an innovation and the mass production of new technology and media during the time and this uh, you know when we when we talk about the innovation of science and technology in the fields of science and technology and we talk about the mass production of media the altered the psychogeography of the 20th century inhabitants of western world now this is very interesting in the regard that modernism it rose as a rebellion it rose as a knee jerk reaction against these evolutionary trends of modernity so i believe that by this time the ideas of modern modernity and modernism are clear to one and all so the term modernism yes it is historically located yes it is a grand phenomenon during the 20th century yes it is marked by literary artistic and musical outputs but why is this rebellion what is it reacting against it is reacting against the contemporary modernity interestingly modernism as i have been telling you it contains the paradox of the term modern within it it not only reflects the contemporary modernity but also reacts against that it re it it reacts against the uh, you know the consumerist society it reacts against the uh, the the progressive society so interestingly modernism when it is playing and experimenting with forms the terms like avant-garde when we look at the radical the progressive and the revolutionary uh, you know exponents of of art literature and music now these these responses are responses against the term of modernity so once again as i have been telling you the responses are quite contradictory in nature as well because when we look at modernist architecture it's it, it embraced modernity and when we look at art forms it once again negated the outputs of modernity so it tries to reflect the society by reacting against it to <clears throat> to quote henry lefer uh, the absolute sovereignty of modernism is assured in around 1910 by a rupture with the classical and the traditional vocabulary the reign is consolidated after the world war 1 through cubism abstract art the rise of the bauhaus etc the reign lasts until the 60s and 70s and then another reign is ushered in so um 
talking about the trends of modernism or rather if we, if we want to uh, if we want to categorize the trends of modernism there can be two broad uh, uh, points one is of course the anti traditional artistic tendencies and the other one how modernization was trying to update or upgrade the religious doctrines of the times of, of, of uh, the, the the traditional uh, uh, you know religious doctrines with the radical socio political economic scientific discoveries and uh, analysis that characterized the age um okay now um i have been talking about how modernism was a reaction against uh, the contemporary uh, modernity so uh, this is a kind of a flow chart which will help us understand the modernist literature or or uh, basically the modernist art a little better so we talked about how the sense of modernism it stems from the rejection of contemporary european culture and uh, they were trying to look at a society which was fraught with corruption complacency and artificialities which was marked by a moral emotional and spiritual bankruptcy now when we when we look at a society like this we are of course the first thing that we look at is is the representation of this kind of society through art and literature and interestingly art and literature during that time they were they were not able to represent they were not able to accommodate the uh, the uh, you know th these these realities of the society through their discourse so there was a there was a dissatisfaction with the contemporary anemic society which once again led to the exploration of other alternatives and when i talk about the other alternatives i not only mean the other uh, you know uh, the other philosophies the other cultures but also the other modes of representation so this need for a different for an alternate mode of representation something that could represent the society to its truest form that required a new jargon or rather if i may there was a requirement of a new text to fit the new context talking about modernism as a movement um i told you that it's an over it, it's an expansive term it could be related to the sciences philosophy psychology music painting sculpture architecture literature so when we look at modernism as a uh, as as a as as a grand phenomenon it's very interesting to note in this regard that all these that all these uh, uh, you know movements that we all these mini movements all these micro movements that we are talking about within the grand uh, narrative of isms now all of these there are some delineating features and the the most uh, recognized features are that all these movements they are built on a sense of lost community and civilization and embodied a series of contradictions and paradoxes now often these contradictions and paradoxes they embrace multiple features of modern sensibility now when we talk about the loss of a sense of tradition a loss of community we uh, we have a representation of this loss in a sense of tradition through the uh, you know through these uh, forms like there was a lament in extreme form of reactionary conservatism there was a celebration as a means of liberation from the past talking about the increasing dominance of technology which was condemned vehemently and yet again it was embraced as a flagship of progress so once again when we look at uh, 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 when we look at how technology was on the one hand condemned vehemently and on the other it was also embraced as a flagship of progress we understand that the the this central idea of paradox this this paradoxical nature of modernism is is going to be reflected in the art movements is going to be reflected in the literary movements of the time as well as consequences we have aesthetics of experimentation we have fragmentation ambiguity nihilism a variety of theories that try to uh, <coughs> that try to pictureize modernism and the diversity of practices now roughly speaking modernism as a phenomenon was driven by the theories of or was driven by uh, the ideas of 
these three people, Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud. Now, Darwin's theory of evolution through natural, select, uh, through, sorry, through natural selection was a radical attack on the religious certainties of the time. It questioned the human uniqueness and brutally attacked the conventional belief structures. When we look at Marx, Marx's ideas about the intransigence of economic order, the fundamental contradictions which exist within a capitalist system, was a driving force for modernism. And of course, in your undergrad studies, you must have noted, even if you have not, maybe, I don't know, but even if you have not talked about Darwin and Marx, this person you all know, Sigmund Freud, because the term psychoanalysis is not new to you. So Freudian psychoanalysis, something that focused on human psyche, the mind as basic and fundamental to perceiving the world around, not only shaped the, the, mo the major movements of the time, but had a profound impact on the literature of the times. So coming to the major thoughts or, uh, you know, the major trends uh, uh, which uh, characterize modernism, one is imagism. The next is symbolism, existentialism, and nihilism. Now, um, imagism or the imagist movement was uh, was basically a, a, a cultural uh, and artistic movement in the early 20th century, which is accredited to the famous American poet Ezra Pound. Now, uh, when when they were looking at poetry, they were uh, they were looking at it from uh, from the from a, from a stylistic angle. They they believed that poetry should be devoid of the excess baggage of language. They were looking for a visual concreteness in literature, and thereby they revolted against the very loose texture of the Georgian poetry. Now. Imagism in art and literature, it, it continued to influence the literature of high modernism. And when I talk about high modernism, I usually try to mean the 1920s to 1940s. The other movement, symbolism or the symbolist movement, it, it was basically an art movement which influenced literature. It tried to, uh, it tried to express the individual emotional experience through the use of carefully chosen symbols. And some of the famous symbolist poets are Stephen Mallarmé, uh, Paul Verlaine, Arthur Rabo, uh, Julia Laforgue, Remy de Gourmont. And uh, all these poets, mostly the French symbolist poets, they have influenced Eliot's uh, poetry. <clears throat> Talking about symbolism or the symbolist poetry, they attempted to present the impressions of inner life of individuals through a complex matrix of symbols. They attempted to express the inexpressible reality. Um, the last two points in the slide, one is nihilism and the other one is existentialism. Now, the word nihilism was used during the mid 19th century which uh, which was uh, uh, which tried to uh, accommodate the sense of a negation of value and meaning right and uh, when we talk about value and meaning i i generally mean the the, uh, the values and meanings that we ascribe to our existence and um, existentialism is uh, uh, it's derived or rather it uh, kind of stemmed from the ideas of nihilism. It stemmed from the ideas of nihilism, which was uh, es expressed by uh, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is, uh, is uh, associated with uh, the term nihilism. And existentialism was a cultural movement towards the 1940s and 50s, um, uh, which tried to debunk the idea of essentialism. Now, the term essentialism, it holds the belief that you are born for a particular purpose, you are born to do a certain thing. There is a pre-programmed, uh, quote unquote, essence that there is a purpose in life. Existentialism negates that. It believes that there is no purpose in life. And Nietzsche and later on Sartre, in their post-war worldview, they proposed the idea of existentialism, uh, according to which, once again, simply putting, your choices determine your existence. The other influential thinkers of the times are um, Einstein, who published his uh, ideas on the general relativity, uh, Max Planck on quantum theory, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, uh, Sartre, 
Andrew Bergson, William James, uh, Carl Jung, and Ferdinand the Sussur. So due to lack of time, I'm not uh, going to talk about uh, any of these thinkers, but, uh, you know, I would rather, uh, you know, I would rather expect, I mean, request you to explore more on how they, these uh, people were influencing modernist literature. Now, as I told you, that I will be talking about or I will be exploring modernism as an artistic literary movement or cultural movement in the 20th century through various art forms. And uh, uh, I have chosen a few art forms. Of course, there are many. There are a lot many. But I have chosen only three or four art forms or art movements of the times for this particular presentation. The first one is Dadaism. Now, if you look at the picture, you will be, uh, I mean, you will be shocked by by the kind of uh, representation, like a urinal, like the, the deliberate disfigurement of, of the picture of Mona Lisa. So Dadaism was basically a revolutionary, irreverent uh, uh, art movement, which was marked by deli uh, which was marked by rejection of artistic authority. Take, for example, these paintings by Marcel Duchamp. Now, the term Dadaism was coined by Tristan Jara. The movement was a reaction against the callousness of the world leaders, the shock of casualties vis-a-vis -vis the casual approach of the consumer society portrayed in art and literature. Now, when we look at the Dadaist paintings, it's very essential to note in this regard that this art movement, this reactionary art movement, was triggered by Freudian psychoanalyst theories and Marxist, Marxist assumptions. And the next movement that I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about is Cubism. Now, Cubism, now these are paintings. One is the famous one, Guernica, and the other one is the lady with the mandolin, both of which are painted by Picasso. So, Cubism as an art form, it rejected the traditional art styles, it deconstructed figures by fragments, challenged forms, figures, and clarity. And as you note from these paintings, they defied the form, texture, and dimension of art objects. Two of the most powerful exponents of, these, of this form of art movement is Picasso and Braque. The next art movement that I'm going to talk about or you know, I'm going to uh, kind of explore is expressionism. Now, expressionism as well, it reacted against the materialism, the complacent bourgeois prosperity of the times, the rapid mechanization and the urbanization. It was a dominant artistic and literary movement in Germany during and immediately after World War I. And we find distorted figures representing distortions of the mind, especially the, this one, uh, the one in my left. The, if you look at uh, this, this picture is uh, titled The Screen. So, uh, uh, by, I mean, the distorted figures we talk about, they represent the distortions of the mind of, of, of a diseased society. So uh, we, we find, I mean, uh, those of you who have read Elias' poetry, I mean, you must be aware of the line, let us go, then you and I, but the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. So this comparison of the society, of a, of a disintegrating society with a, a diseased uh, person with a, with a diseased individual is uh, it has been influenced by expressionist art as well. The major proponents of this art form were Van Gogh and uh, Edward Munch. As I told you that uh, there are other many other art forms, many other art movements like Orbism, Boticism. <coughs> In, in, in the paradigm of modernism, in the, in the paradigm of modernist art movements as well. The, um, this is probably the last one that I'll be talking about, the last um, art movement that I'll be talking about, and this is futurism. Now, if you look at the paintings, you will find a, a, a lack of clarity. You will find a sense of motion in the picture, uh, especially if you look at the picture in, in your left. If you if you see this one, you will find that there is a, there. It's a, it's basically look, it looks like it looks like a collage of too many things. Uh, uh, maybe uh, as one of my students or uh, once observed that it looks like uh, uh, an open geometry box. So the protector and the ruler and the compass, everything is out there. So this picture and the, and the one beside it, we find that 
there is no concrete meaning to it. There is no concrete delineation of, of forms. I mean, so clarity in the forms, if I mean. And this was the hallmark of futurist art. So this was an Italian art during the 20th century, which represented urban cosmopolitanism, dynamism in terms of speed, energy, and the, and the uh, burgeoning rise of technology, which tried to encapsulate the restlessness of modern life. The major proponents of futurism were Filippo Marinetti, Carlo Cara, and the prominent themes in futurist art were automobiles, which stood for destruction, aggression, and once again, very interesting to note, smashing the past heritage. So through their painting, they were not only challenging the past heritage, but also they were challenging the past representations, the past forms of representations, if I may. Um, Having had, uh, having had a tour of, um, of some of the major art movements of the time, it's time that we consolidate our ideas regarding modernist literature and art. So uh, these are some of the points that, uh, or these are some of the features which, gen which can really uh, accommodate the, the basic idea of modernist literature and modernist art. And what are they? One is intentional distortion of shapes, the focus on form rather than meaning, breaking down of the limitations of space and time. When we talk about the breakdown of the limitations of space and time, we are once again looking at a, a debunking of the conventional norms of representation, breakdown of social norms and cultural values, dislocation of meaning and sense from its normal context, representation of the despairing individual in the face of an unmanageable future. Modernist art and literature is marked by a sense of disillusionment. We have already talked about why this disillusionment, and we have talked about the crisis in, in moral in morality, we have talked about the crisis in the faith structures, the shift, the shift in the faith structures, if I may, which leads to a, a rejection of history and once again disillusionment in the present history. And when we talk about the rejection of history of the of the contemporary history, it's a substitution by a mythical past. Uh, there was a need to reflect the complexity of modern urban life in literature. And uh, there again, when we talk about the modern urban life, what comes into, uh, uh, what comes into discussion is the unconscious mind. And I told you already that uh, the Freudian psychoanalytic theories were a major, uh, played a major role in the development of uh, the modernist trends in the development theories, um, interest in the primitive and non-Western cultures, and impossibility of an absolute interpretation of reality. Now, those of you who are aware of, uh, of uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, you already know that Saussure was one of the, uh, uh, I mean, I won't say that he was the first one, but he was kind of uh, the, the pioneers of, he was one of the pioneers in appreciating and understanding language as a system of arbitrarily placed signs. Signs which hold no meaning, uh, you know, until and unless it is placed in a, in a context. So this uh, interpretation of reality or absolute interpretation of reality becomes an impossible task. And this is something which is explored in the modernist text when we look at the wasteland when we look at ulysses when we look at the <clears throat> when we look at the po other poems during that period we realize that all these poets and artists they are trying to <clears throat> represent the in 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 inexpressible they are trying to express the inexpressible uh, looking at modernist literature, we have already tried to break the idea of 20th century literature, uh, where the first first half of 20th century literature is the war is the war poetry from uh, 1900s to 1910s and all. The then rises the period as I talked about from 1920 to 1940, which is regarded as the period of high modernism. And when we look at the period of high modernism, we generally uh, kind of uh, divide or we generally kind of look at the idea of high modernism in, in, in terms of poetry, novels, and plays. Now, when we look at poetry, we generally look at T.S. Eliot, W.B. Yeats, Ezra Pound, and W.H. Auden. 
Now, uh, interestingly, uh, what is not mostly talked about is a, is a, is a, uh, is a contribution of the Oxford poets during the 1930s, which is uh, ushered in, which was ushered in by poets like Christopher Usherwood, Cecil Day Lewis, uh, uh, Auden W. H. Auden, who rejected Eliot's esotericism and presented the political realities of the times in a voice whose clarity could be understood by all. Um, the basic features of uh, modernist poetry were number one the unconventional use of metaphors as you must have i mean when you have read uh, either the love song of gr true flock or any other poem by t.s Eliot in your undergrad studies you must have noted the play of metaphors the unconventional use of metaphors in, in the poetry um yes uh, did anybody say anything like uh, um, did anybody say anything i mean um, ma'am revati no, ma'am ma no, ma okay okay Let's do all right all right thank you ma'am so uh, uh, as we note that uh, if we have looked at if we have looked at the poetry of T.S. Eliot at any point in time, we have noted how there was a play of metaphors, unconventional use of metaphors, um, and and mostly because uh, uh, you know there was a multiple narrative points of view. So if we look at the poem "The Wasteland," uh, I mean I'm sure that you will be reading or you are you have already read "The Wasteland," and you found that you know the poem had multiple voices it had multiple narrative points of view free verse intertextuality and allusions so these are some of the demarcating features of modernist poetry there's a meta narrative across the poem the which which is once again broken into the smaller narratives so there is one grand narrative and there are many other smaller narratives within the paradigm of the poem and we also note the use of interior monologue and stream of consciousness across the poems. So these are once again some of the features of uh, modernist poetry. Now, some of the formal features of poetry are written in open form, use of free verse, juxtaposition of ideas. Now, when we look at, uh, say, for example, the very first poem of, uh, of the Wasteland, The Burial of the Dead, we find that ideas, complex ideas, are juxtaposed. I mean, there is no sequential, linear way of storytelling. There is no uh, a linear flow of the poem, but rather, uh, uh, you know, a complex pattern, a mosaic pattern, which I, you know, tend to use. There's a sense of intertextuality, use of allusions and multiple associations of words, borrowings from other cultures and languages, unconventional use of symbols, and importance which is given to sound to convey the music of ideas. Once again, I have been repeating, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have been repeating myself kind of, uh, uh, I mean, when I talk about Eliot's poetry, but uh, this importance which is given to sound is also reflected it's also represented by Eliot through his poems as well uh, talking about the uh, the novels during this period uh, talking about uh, the you know the general trends of novels uh, or of fiction if i may um, there were two major categories of experimentation one was experimentation in style and the other one was experimentation with the narration so when we talk about the experimentation in style, we are looking at a non-linear narrative as, as, as episodes, okay, as many episodes, as not as a series of chronological moments, but rather as, as, as episodes, uh, 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 or rather, if I may, as small little boxes of memories that come in our mind. So the term stream of consciousness, which is associated with the, with the theories of Jung and Freud, they are very closely related to modernist fiction. For those of you who have read A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, you will agree with me when I say that, you know, the, the poem, I'm, I'm sorry, the novel, it lacks a, a linear narrative. It lacks a, a, a cohesion, if I may. So this was an experimentation in style that was being attempted by the novelists. And the next one is experimentation with the narration. So 
the novelists at that point in time they preferred to plunge into the consciousness of their characters in order to tell their stories rather than provide an external framework of the chronological narrative so this experimentation in style which is the form and experimenting with the narration which is the content it characterized the modernist novels the last topic that i'm going to talk about is modernist plays and uh, when we talk about modernist plays it, it will be in i mean our discussion will remain incomplete if we do not talk about the epic theater of the times so if, if we do not talk about how theater was conceived as a space to educate it was conceived as a as a as a, as a medium to uh, emphasize on the socio political messages to uh, react against the naturalism and uh, the most prominent uh, the most uh, uh, prominent exponent of uh, of modernist plays is of course uh, you know bertrand brecht and uh, when we talk about brecht we, we need to talk about his uh, alienation effect which was uh, inspired by shlopsky's theory of defamiliarization now uh, when when we look at the alienation effect uh, it once again tries to break the fourth wall it tries to jolt uh, the the uh, the audience it tries to bring the audience to a uh, to an understanding the uh, you know that uh, that uh, about the real reality if i may so what brecht was intending to do was he was trying to create a world within a stage he was trying to create through the stage effects and involve the audience in the theatrical presentation itself so uh, this basically rounds off my discussion on modern modernity and modernism and uh, through my presentation i have tried to delineate the the ideas i have tried to compare and contrast the ideas of modernity and modernism very briefly once again i have tried to encapsulate the the central ideas pertaining to modernism trying to generate a comprehensive idea of looking at uh, this uh, reaction artistic and cultural reaction of the 20th century i try to talk about the 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 major uh, art movements some of the major art movements if i may um i i also tried to talk about the modernist literature in uh, in terms of poetry novel and plays but uh, although i will be ending my discussion here uh, but it is to note that it is a very uh, i mean you know it, it's not a, a very expansive discussion or uh, because it's not possible as i said at the very onset that it's not possible to talk about the grand narrative or, or, or the or the huge topic if i mean of modernism and modern literature in just uh, one session in just a single session because there are so many things to discuss uh, we have barely touched upon freud psychoanalysis we have barely talked about carl gustav jung we have barely talked about we have not even talked about fraser and and, and all the uh, and the, all the works of marx and and uh, all the works of uh, you know um, uh, how, how science was influencing literature how technology was influencing literature so those uh, you know are for you to explore so i will uh, i will stop at this point and uh, i would really thank you all for for being present in this session I would I would stop at this point and if there are any uh, questions, please. Thank you, ma'am. That was an intensifying and informative session. Now the session is open to the participants for question and answer. Participants, kindly raise your questions verbally by unmuting your mic, or you can post your questions in chat box. participants you can raise your questions verbally or you can post your questions in chat box um thank you ma'am uh, did you find i mean i'm asking the students in the session here uh, and thank you so much for your appreciation uh, i mean did you find it uh, relevant honestly speaking because our journey our journey of discussion started with how the term modern it refers to something that holds relevance to our present time so uh, did you find the session relevant because 
I believe that uh, you know uh, you all, some of you. I mean, you must be having ideas if you are pursuing postgraduate studies. You already have certain ideas uh, pertaining to modernism and modern literature. But uh, could I kind of uh, make some sense? Yes, anybody? The question from Matt. Uh, there is a question from Anupam Roy. Mm -hmm. uh, Ma'am, can you please throw light on issues of psychoanalysis and modernism and more? Expect reference to the theories of Sigmund Freud, Jacobus Lakin, yeah. Carl Jung, and so on. Thank you so much, Ma'am. So, uh, Who's this? Uh, Anupam, uh, dear Anupam, um, I believe uh, you are uh, you are a post grad student, right? Anupam Roy, are you there? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hi. Uh, so um, you have asked me to sh uh, throw some light on the issues of psychoanalysis, right? So uh, as I have been telling you that for Freud, the idea of uh, or Rather, I mean, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, when we look at Freudian psychoanalysis or Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are not the same, right? And Jung talks about the collective unconsciousness. So these are, uh, you know, trends of looking at the mind. These are trends of, uh, of exploring the, the uh, significance of the human mind because I mean, I believe if you have written about Laka, so you must be knowing that how Freud was uh, talking about dreams uh, being the royal road to the unconscious. Right. And interestingly, all these, I mean, uh, if, I, if I talk about Freud, Laka and Jung, they, ref they had profound influence on modern literature. Right. I mean, when when you look at uh, Eliot's poetry, when we when you look at the the, uh, the modern poetry per se, you cannot ignore the uh, the influence of these psychoanalyst the I mean psychoanalytic theories on on literature. And uh, I mean to talk about uh, Freud, Lacan, Jung. Uh, interestingly, my dear, it will take me maybe another two to three hours. So uh, what I would suggest uh, you to do, I mean, if it is possible, once again, you explore uh, about uh, Freud, uh, Lacan, and uh, Jung. Uh, so uh, Jacques Lacan, he was, he was uh, kind of a uh, I, 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 Lacanian theories are basically not an, not only an extension of Freudian theories, but also a challenge to to Freudian theories. So uh, what I would suggest is, you know, if, if you could look up for that, and if you have, if you need any help from my end, you can reach me in my email. So I would be happy to talk about it. This is a, a this is a topic which is very close to my heart, and uh, honestly speaking, I I love to talk about psychoanalysis and and not only the birth of psychoanalysis but also how it continued to influence uh, the literature of the modernist age and continued to influence uh, the postmodern literature as well. So uh, thank you for your uh, thank you for your comment, Anupam. Thank you, ma'am. Participants, you can ask your questions. I mean, you can also share your views about the session. Uh, Ma'am, your mic is mute, ma'am. Oh, my apologies. Uh, uh, my apologies. Yeah. Um, okay, alienation effect. Uh, okay, uh, Rimjin has asked about the uh, alienation effect, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rimjin. Uh, you there? Yes, ma'am. Hi, it's so nice to uh, listen. I mean, hear your voice after quite some time. So, um, alienation effect was basically um, an, a, a, a theatrical uh, device which was uh, explored by uh, the uh, by the by the proponents of epic theater, if I may. 
particularly by uh, Bertrand Brecht, because the term alienation effect or the V effect is uh, is associated with Bertrand Brecht. So what what they tried to do was break the fourth wall and accommodate the audience in the uh, uh, you know in, in the play itself. So when you are watching a play, you realize, I mean, there are constant episodes which jolt you to reality. And maybe it, it, it kind of tells you that this is just a theatrical production. This is not the reality, but rather it's a representation of reality. Rinchen, have you watched the movie Deadpool? Have, no, you, have, you, have you watched the movie Deadpool? No, ma'am. I no. haven't watched. Okay. If possible, please uh, watch because, uh, you know, it, it's a very humorous way of representing what it actually means to, you know, break the fourth wall. Those of you who have watched Deadpool, doesn't Deadpool, I mean, when the film is going on, doesn't he at a time, you know, he, he talks to you directly. Like, this is not a Marvel movie. This is, this is uh, you know, not a time when Sam uh, Jackson is going to come out. So... This breaking of the fourth wall, this uh, accommodates, accommodates the audience inside the paradigm of the play. So this alienation effect. Now, theater is supposed to present a slice of reality, right? But it is a representation, nevertheless. It's not the real reality. It's a representation. So when, when these people, they were presenting the, the theater in this particular way, say, for example, Mother Courage, by Brecht or uh, or any other any other uh, you know plays written by Brecht which was performed when you look at these you understand that what they were trying to do was they were trying to break the trend of naturalism okay so they were trying to uh, challenge the ideas of a realist theater of a naturalist theater okay so uh, Rimjim I would uh, really love to hear from you later as well I hope I have a uh, kind of sort of clarified. Yes, ma'am, it's clear now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It just reminds me of, uh, you know, the classes that I once had with you. Thank you. Um, Anupam I has a question from Anupam. Right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, can we say that authors like James Joyce, Virginia w was influenced by this? Absolutely, absolutely, Anupam, absolutely so. Um, okay, absolutely so. And interestingly, thanks that you mentioned about James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. Uh, you know, when, when you read a text like uh, maybe the collection of short stories like the Dubliners, what you understand is, remember I talked about the complex matrix of symbols? So what Joyce or Wolf they are trying to do is they are trying to present the inner workings of the human mind. Okay, they are working, they are trying to narrate the, the, the journey of the hero, not in a spatio-temporal landscape, but through their own mind we are looking at the evolution of the hero of the, of, the, of the narrative we are looking at the evolution of the narrative if i may through looking at through exploration of the mental landscape so yes of course they were very much influenced by the psychoanalytic theories of freud and jung very much um yeah yeah of course the stream of consciousness technique yeah of course uh, yeah uh, i mean you know the flow of memories as it comes and once again challenging the the you know uh, the linearity of a narrative um thank you uh, one can you talk a little about meta narrative uh, give us some examples on meta narrative See the term meta narrative. It is it is associated with a grand narrative, right? I use the term meta narrative to talk about how one particular grand structure, one particular big structure, if I may, contains within it micro narratives. Take for example the wasteland. Uh, your name is Darshini, right? Uh, Yes. So Darshini, uh, you find, for example, if you look at the wasteland by T.S. Eliot. So there is one perpet one grand theme, if I may, one big narrative. And within that, there is an exploration of mini narratives, all of which try to or rather are held within the single umbrella term. Now, if you are asked to note, uh, I mean, uh, 
I mean, are, are you have you read the wasteland, Maria? I mean, have you have you read it? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, in any other, uh, um, okay. All right. Let me let me try to uh, you know explain a bit simply. Um, if you look at the poem, the wasteland, and I would suggest uh, Darshini. Please, if it is possible, please read it. Okay, I mean, I'm sure you, I'm sure you will love it. Okay, and if possible, I mean, you may WhatsApp me or you may uh, email me as well. I'm, I'm open to that. So, uh, you know, when you read a poem like the Wasteland, you find that the major theme is the emotional sterility. It is the, it's a moral uh, vacancy of, of individuals. It's a vacancy of morality. It's a loss of faith structures. It's a cultural crisis, etc. But there are certain other smaller narratives as well, certain other smaller themes as well. So meta narrative, the term narrative means story. So it's basically like a big story, meta narrative, a grand narrative. And there are several other smaller stories all within the big story. Is it somewhat clear? That she yes, ma'am. Yes, ma OK. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, I mean, to are there any students who would really raise some questions and get clarification from Ms. Roy? And she has done a very uh, wonderful presentation. I'm really glad that you gave it. Uh, I'm really happy and thankful to uh, Dibanjali. Thank you, Dibanjali. Thank you so <laughs> much, nice ma'am. presentation. Thank and, you so uh, much, uh, yeah. Any other student who would like to have any clarification, I'm happy that Darshini raised that the questions. Anyway, uh, thank you for sparring. It's your wonderful, your precious time with us. Ravati, ma'am. I'm said more than uh, webinar. Yeah. It was a very lively as we can proceed. Uh, please give me what of them. I think uh, all are... yes, Thank you for answering all the questions, ma'am. And thank you for answering patiently. Now I am Ms. Priyani Ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of English, MGR Educational Institute, to provide a vote of thanks. Thank you, Ma'am. It's, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks. And I would like to start with the quote the way to develop the best that is in a person is by appreciation and encouragement. And I, first and foremost, I thank the Almighty for giving the positive energy to bring out this program and digital platform. And at the outset, I thank our chief guest and resource person, Ms. Deebanjali Roy, for uh, taking out her time in, the, in her busy schedule and uh, enlightening us with the knowledge. Thank you, ma'am. And I thank our honorable president, engineer ACS Arun Kumar, sir, for providing the opportunity and motivation. We place a heartfelt and sincere thanks to our registrar, Dr. C.V. Palaniwil, and joint registrar, Dr. J.D. D.B. Jabaraj, and N.S. Vishrima, Dean E.N.S., for their unflinching support. And our heartfelt thanks to our Dean uh, English, Dr. Mary Thomas, ma'am, and Dr. R. Pushkla, ma'am, Dean English, in charge of Literary Seminary, for their positive vibe and guidance. And I thank Dr. Our head department of English and Chandra Sena Rajeshwaran ma'am for her moral support and guidance. 
and i also like to thank our deputy hod dr v katpaga varivu for her continuous support and coordination i also thank the other faculty members and the organizing team for their cooperation and with warm words and kind words a uh, sincere and heartfelt thanks and appreciation to the participants thank you for your cooperation for your patient listening thank you once again thank you ma'am uh, dear participants the feedback link will be posted in the chat box please fill it with your valuable comments and feedbacks once again thank you ma'am dipanjali ma'am it was very informative session thank you so much thank you so much ma'am thank you dear participants the feedback